we're talking about existential There's, terror. I know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Important things to. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. My name is Shane Ivey. Uh, I'm the publisher with Dark Dream Publishing. We uh, recently released this uh, limited edition of the King in Yellow uh, annotated edition. So we're here to talk about that and to talk with our um, lovely guests about Robert Chambers, his work in general, the, the impact of the King in Yellow mythos, um, and whatever else the people want to talk about. Uh, I'm a big believer in letting the smart people talk, so I'm, that's what I intend to do. So just for some background, uh, I came I came to horror as a genre, as a literary genre, like a lot of people these days, or especially in my generation, through gaming, uh, through Call of Cthulhu, and through Dungeons and Dragons, and the thing at the end of one of the Dungeons and Dragons books that said, read this thing by H.P. Lovecraft, right? And so I started reading that, and I loved it, it was beautiful. Uh, and then about 10 years later, there was a piece in a magazine, this little tiny zine called The Unspeakable Oath, that dealt with Carcosa and the yellow sign. And it wasn't the first time those things had been dealt with for Call of Cthulhu, but it completely blew my mind. And ever since that, I've been, I've been absolutely fascinated with Chambers mythology. Uh, and the more I've learned, the more fascinating it becomes, not least because most of what we know of, as Chambers mythology emerged in, what, maybe four short stories, a little bit more than that, out of a 40-year career of dozens and dozens and dozens of books. He made all of his money writing romances. But what we remember him for today is the early efforts that he promptly got rid of. So uh, I want to introduce our, uh, our guests here. Uh, and I want to thank you very much, uh, Jim Lauder who's executive editor at Chaosium, for joining the discussion here. Uh, Nicole Cushing, whose uh, new book is Sick Gray Cough. Sick, sick Gray, gray laugh. laugh. A, a Sick Gray Laugh. Very good. I'm, my apologies. Uh, and uh, Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, whose uh, new thing is Gods of Jade and Shadow. Yeah. Uh, and then you're also doing a fundraiser for... Make sure I get the title right. Uh, the Road of Ice and Salt on Indiegogo, which is the translation of a cult Mexican vampire novella. Uh, okay. It's also a queer novella, so if you like gothic, vampire, queer, or novella, please type mm. The Road of Ice and Salt on <laughs> in Indiegogo and donate $5. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the annotations for this book. I, I wish I could have the artist here, Samuel Oriya, who um, did the paintings and the charcoal sketches, which are incredibly creepy and have their own amazing backstory. But he lives in South America, and so we only get him occasionally. But the annotations and the research, the heavy lifting here, was done by my old friend and colleague, Kenneth Height, who's right here. So I guess uh, first things first, I would love to hear from Ken. Uh, when you, were, when you started on this project, what was, I guess, what's the first thing that took you by surprise? I mean, I guess the first thing that took me by surprise was how little there was on Chambers. Mm -hmm. Because I thought that I would just be able to lean back and real scholars of horror would have done all the work and I could just read the five or six really top-notch essays, just go through JSTOR and find a few uh, things that you know some MLA guy who was desperate for a thesis, and I could read that, and I'd be done. And I'd say, well, I pretty much am au courant with Chambers, and there was nothing. There was almost exactly nothing. There was an essay in The Romantist, which analyzed him as a romantic author, but it analyzed King and Yellow as a proto-romance. There was a little bit about the Gothic by a guy named Weinstein. There was um, an essay by uh, Brian Stapleford that I ran into about halfway through the process, which I really love because Brian Stapleford is amazing. Yeah. And that was just about it in terms of things over two paragraphs written about Robert W. Chambers since 1933. There was that, and there was a, I hesitate even to say biography, but I'm going to say with a lot of air quotes, biography of him by a guy named Sean Tomlinson, which was self-published and was a lot of 
I used to think that Robert W. Chambers had an affair with this lady, but then I looked up her birth date, and she would have been 20 years older than him and didn't live in the town. It's like, oh, thanks, Sean Tomlinson. That was a, that was a helpful note. I'm glad to know that you did that. We can get a great book yeah. on what didn't like, happen. I mean, yeah. If I'm allowed to do that, these annotations go crazy. It's like him and Marlena Dietrich are carrying on. It's going to be amazing. But um, so the uh, so so. There was this guy's biography, and he sort of assembled a few facts. He grew up in Broad Albans, so he sort of, and then in the in the biography, he's like, "Gosh, I wish I'd ever talked to anyone in New Chambers. That would have really helped with his biography." <laughs> yep, yep, it would. <laughs> so there was very little written about him, and I guess that was my surprise. Is you know, Chambers is to us in horror very much a seminal figure, despite the very small amount that he wrote. He's done. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, he, he, he wrote 90 other books that we resolutely ignore, but someone should have touched on any of them. They were bestsellers. They were huge cultural oh, moments. And they, that, were, they were turned into movies. Right, the yeah. D.W. Yeah. Yeah. Griffith was a buddy of his. Yeah, right? Secret Service Operator 13 starring yeah. Gary Cooper. Right. <laughs> um, uh, there, there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of Chambers' presence in popular culture, you know, down, <laughs> really down to the TV show uh, Finder of Lost Loves, yes. which was based on a Chambers uh, uh, sort of picaresque novel or, or serial novel uh, called uh, Tracer of Lost Persons. And uh, oh, I, I, I take that back. Joshi wrote a lengthy essay about Chambers for uh, Evolution of the Weird Tale, uh, which uh, is Joshi. Um, I read that. So. But, but there was very little uh, actual uh, scholarly work done on Chambers, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Uh, all right. So. I guess what's uh, in addition to sort of setting the context, maybe we can hear from Ken, from the other panelists here. What's been your relationship um, up up to for Ken? You know, up to this gigantic piece of work. Let's say, excluding that, what's been your relationship with the Chamber Stories, with the Yellow Sign, and uh, and so on? I mean, before he moved into my house for yeah, four months, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I I ran across the yellow sign, obviously, in Whisper in Darkness was my first encounter with the word Carcosa and the right. words uh, Lake of Ali. And then I think Lynn Carter put one of the stories, and I believe it was the yellow sign, in uh, Spawn of Cthulhu, that very first Cthulhu Mythos anthology that he put together. And then, so I would have read that there, and I think during the time that I was running Call of Cthulhu and desperately trying to read more Cthulhu mythos than my players so that I would always have something to spring on them, mm -hmm. I would have found uh, maybe the Ace, I, I own the Ace uh, Chambers from 1967 paperback, and maybe that was the first Chambers that I found, or maybe it was the Blyler Dover edition of Chambers, which was published in 70-something, and also would have been sitting in Oklahoma City used bookstores waiting for me to slurp it up. And at that time, I. I read all of the Yellow Mythos ones, which makes me think it was the Blyler that I saw first. And then I found the whole book and was like, oh, great, five more chamber stories. Oh, cool, four of them are about romancing young ladies in Paris. <laughs> That'll come in handy in my Call of Cthulhu game. Uh, and, I, and I did notice that um, uh, I, I very much liked Street of the First Shell. I thought that was a very affecting story and, and that it really worked. And obviously the time slip story, uh, Mademoiselle, uh, Mademoiselle Dies, um was a uh, was a great little you know sort of a Twilight Zoney ending. And there's a character named Hastor, and you're wondering why is Hastor working as the undergroom in this castle in the 1570s? He, well, he fell on hard times. Everyone's got to earn, earn a nickel, I guess. But. I really hadn't then sort of gone back to Chambers except to every now and again I'd run into Repair or I'd run into Yellow Sign and I'd reread them. But until this came along, I hadn't gone back to Chambers as a, as a holistic unit. It was just sort of something that hung around. And then when John Tynes wrote, I didn't see Road to Holly first. I saw the Haster mythos in the Delta Green uh, countdown. Right. And when he wrote that essay, I did a great deal of chin scratching and saying, I believe John Tynes is correct. But I, I don't think that even that drove me back to Chambers to, 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 to re-encounter it or, or re-integrate it. Yeah. What about you, Sylvia? Any thoughts? Like, a, how, how did I, oh, my God, this is like, should I even touch it? <laughs> okay. 
All right. Hello. Um, so how did I come in contact with with Chambers? Why am I on this panel? Yeah. Another question? Justify yourself here, please. Okay, yeah. Well, what happened was that uh, last night around 10 p.m. <laughs> said, do you want to be on a panel? And I was drunk. So I said yes. <laughs> No, <laughs> that is true, but there is more to it than that. <laughs> but what they don't know is prior to that story. Prior to that story. No, um, I mean, well, there's two things. I, I guess one, one is that I wrote a, I, I guess the reason why you remember was that I wrote kind of like a King in Yellow story a long time ago, um, which is actually about a pornographic theater in Mexico City in the 1980s where they're showing this movie um, that, has this woman dressed in yellow, and you know, bad stuff happens. And uh, a lot of people, when I go to Necronomicon, that's the story that everybody remembers. It's like the porno in Mexico City that is like <laughs> in yellow, and it's like, yeah, that's what I'm gonna be remembered for for the rest of my life. <laughs> that's just amazing. Um, it's based on a real pornographic theater in Mexico City, not that I would know anything about that. Um, <laughs> but I did write that, and then I've, I've written other stories that rip off on yellow stuff. Like I have a story set in Vancouver in the 1960s, which is called The Yellow Door, which is inspired by a real uh, Chinese uh, eating place that existed there in the 1960s. And um, in my story, it's a gambling den. And of course, bad things happen when you go to The Yellow Door. You'll have to find it. I don't remember what collection it is. It's, it's somewhere. I don't know. I've written a lot of stuff. Um, so I, I use yellow a lot for a lot of things to signify like you know horrible evil stuff. And nobody has cut on cut on to it. So nobody has like until this moment when I'm saying realized that, that I have a series of weird stories that all tie around the color yellow. But yes, it's because of you know like chambers and 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 the yellow sign. And I don't remember where. Um, I saw it for the first time. I think it came in a collection of gothic fiction, and it was just one story, right? Um, and it didn't seem to fit. I was like, what the hell is this? Mm -hmm. Like, everything else was like Henry James, maybe, and like Edgar Allan Poe, and so it was like, it was like yeah, the, the Usher Falls, whatever, and then like crazy like ghost stuff, and, and then it's like, and then there's this thing, and I was like, what is this thing? It seemed to me like an experimental film, mm. but written, you know, like written down. So I guess that's why I came up with um, um, with that. And then there was this weird thing where I thought it was similar to this Borges story called Plon Ukvar Orbius Tertius, which if you were in the Latin American panel, we were talking about that story. But oddly enough, I had read Borges and then I read this thing and I was like, I think these things are connected somehow. And if you've never read that, that's about an imaginary book. Um, an imaginary entry in an encyclopedia about an imaginary land. So somebody opens an encyclopedia and they find like this story about the land of Clon, and they start reading about it, and then they start trying to find more about it. And uh, and this imaginary land invades the real world. It's yeah. a strange story. It's hard to describe. It's about encyclopedias and books, mm. and like and, and like bibliographic entries and stuff like that. But like invading your reality and changing your reality. But I thought that. Both Borges and this dude, after I read more about Chambers, like they were working on the same odd wavelength. So I was like, ah, oh, I don't know, they're like interconnected at a odd cosmic scale. I don't know if that's still true, but at that time, you know, I was drinking a lot of like Diet Coke really late at night, <laughs> lots of sugar as a teenager. And so I probably made, you know, connections that Cheetos and like sugar shouldn't be made. But I did think that they were like, Oh, Borges and Chambers are like connected in some kind of sublime level, but that's that's what I thought, and that's why I thought it was cool. And then later, when I started writing short fiction, I came back to it, and I was like, "Well, somebody asked me like write a short story for like a pornographic collection." I was like, "I don't know about that." And so then I was like, "What about a pornographic theater and the King in Yellow?" <laughs> so that's what happened. Long story. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So. Actually, my first encounter with the King and Yellow Mythos came through the efforts of Joe Pulver, who a lot of you folks probably know, um, who um, you know is under the weather, ill, and has been ill for a while now, but um, he was really the advocate in the weird fiction community for greater awareness 
of uh, of the King in Yellow mythos and of Chambers. I can remember seeing pictures of him at Chambers, <laughs> uh, you know, Tombstone, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, honoring Chambers. And Chambers was his guy, and I think it, that passion uh, made me interested because I'm always interested in authors who are obscure or or uh, you know overlooked. And so, um, yeah, that that was my really you know, it was his advocacy that that made me interested in checking him out and of course what I found was this brilliant eccentricity and uh, I mean especially when you put it in the context of the times when he was writing um, and this mythos that gives you just enough detail to be tantalized and want to know more but not so much that it flushes it all out for you and so it leaves a lot of room for uh, for playing around with it so uh, I, I've contributed to a Chaosium anthology, um, uh, and I think I'm, you may have been in that anthology too, Casilda's uh, song? No, I know about it. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it was an uh, anthology of um, King and Yellow stories written by women, and, uh, and it was, uh, so I set mine in like southern Indiana in a working class uh, home, because that's where I live. I live in southern Indiana in a working class neighborhood, and you know, kind of having this reinterpretation in those, you know, uh, in those terms, and I found that it worked really well as, as a device to kind of get at a certain flavor of madness. Uh, and I'm also intrigued by the connections with Ambrose Bierce because I believe there's, you know, so just a few lines of Bierce helped inspire Carcosa, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and some of the other uh, references. And uh, it, Bierce is a, a strange character. So you have this kind of like lineage starting with very obscure stuff with Bierce. And of course, Bierce is obscure enough anyway because of his disappearance. And so it just lends to the mystery of it. Yes, in Mexico. Uh, and uh, it, it lends to the mystery and. You almost and, fist bumped just then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, nightmarishness. You know, just, you know, you have nightmarishness, you have drama. Uh, you know, literally in the sense of a play, you have, you know, missing texts or, or, or you know, mysterious te texts, all the ingredients of, of something particularly interesting, I think. Um, the, uh, the first time I read Chambers, I was traveling, I had gone to the UK in uh, 1992 for the first time, and I was traveling up to Whitby, which is, you know, where part of Dracula is set. And I had picked up a copy of The King in Yellow from a bookshop in, the UK, in uh, London. And I was reading it on the way up to Whitby where I got sicker and sicker and sicker and mm -hmm. had an incredible attack of appendicitis mm. um, after reading The Repair of Reputations. Mm. So the first- Did it not occur to you, you had better stop. I, exactly, exactly. So it was one of those stories where I read it and then I had to go back and read it again because was it as weird as I remembered or was it <laughs> sort of a fever dream thing? Um, and no, it was as weird as I remembered. Um, and, and it had stuck with me since then. The Terror uh, in particular is a brilliant uh, piece of writing. And uh, since then I've used the material a couple of times in the uh, story I wrote for Shadows Over Baker Street, the uh, Sherlock Holmes mythos anthology. I wrote a story about what happened to um, Watson in Afghanistan. Uh, and for him, he remembers this uh, after Holmes is supposedly dead over the Rickenbach Falls and reason has fallen. And uh, it gives uh, Watson a chance to remember this unreason that he encountered in Afghanistan. And the Chambers uh, mythos for that uh, seemed for the, for the madness and the uh, ways in which it discusses doorways of that madness into reality. Uh, it seemed kind of a perfect choice for that. Um, I've used it again in a uh, pulp story I wrote, The Crooked Smile Killers, uh, which is a story about uh, the, the corpse, uh, this neo-pulp character I created in the 1920s Chicago, uh, and, and uh, use a lot of the material in there. Um, I've been writing it in some scenarios I've been working on for Call of Cthulhu and running it shows, including this one. Uh, it's something that I keep coming back to, uh, in part because for the reasons everyone has mentioned so far, some of the, the, the thematic elements for it, like the place of art in mm -hmm. redefining reality 
and that that's something that Chambers was picking up from the decadence because he was an artist in Paris mm. and was part of that scene. And uh, the King in Yellow is probably yellow because of the Yellow Book and Beardsley and the other uh, decadent uh, writers of the time, that that was all, he was marinating in all of that as he was working on this material. Uh, and it, it's a fascinating uh, glimpse into a, a partial mythology that leaves a lot of room for other writers to fill things in. And I guess I should mention at this juncture that I wrote a story for an anthology that Jim did uh, for Chaosium called Madness on the Orient Express, mm -hmm. in which I mash up The King in Yellow and The Phantom of the Opera. Uh, because that needed to happen. Yes. <laughs> and it's sort of a meta-commentary on the notion of fandom and the notion of IP, uh, and that, you know, in the way that art can poison you, so can unart. art is right. sort of the thesis of that story. So, Ken, I'm, uh, I'm curious, wondering if you can kind of talk a little bit about things that you read or that you uncovered that, surprised, that may have surprised you or may have felt new about some of the origins of the elements of the stories that we're all really familiar with, the king in yellow itself, the, the yellow sign, the, you know, the, the, the whole, uh, that whole scene. Right. Um, in terms of the origins, the more you dig into it, the more fathers the king in yellow turns out to have. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I started, I thought, it's just king, it's just king Lear, good old mad king in tatters, wandering around, giving prophecies, messing with the world. And uh, Vincent Sterrett, the great Chicago bookman and Mackin scholar, agreed with me. He wrote a poem called Cordelia's Song that appeared in Weird Tales, very early piece of the yellow mythos. And then I discovered that, oh, that's odd. Baudelaire had a poem called uh, The Seven Ancients, in which someone sees a tattered figure in yellow rags hmm. seven times in Paris, which if you notice is the number of times the narrator sees the pale organist figure in Court of the Dragon. So, and we know that Chambers was reading Baudelaire because he was in Paris and part of that scene. And I was, I, well, there, that's an interesting play. Oh, look, there's a guy named Marcel Schwab who was a journalist and a decadent writer who wrote a story called The King in the Yellow Mask right. that was about a, a king who wears a golden mask and a blind beggar comes uninvited to the city and shows up at a court function and says, you should take off your mask. And I'm, oh my God. <laughs> and the king takes off his mask, and spoiler for a story written in 1892, it turns out he's a leper. So what's underneath it? A pallid face. And that, of course, feeds back to the legend of um, uh, Mokana, the uh, 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 Af basically an Afghan rebel against the Persians, um, who was supposedly uh, wore a silken mask and uh, conducted himself uh, against the caliph and is seen as this sort of figure of heresy and rebellion and trouble for the prop rightly guided caliphate. And he used magic to make a moon uh, appear over his armies and then vanished uh, when the, the caliph's armies, the rightly guided armies, came to besiege him in his castle. And whether he jumped into the fire or was taken up by demons or just murdered everyone in his own in company and snuck away, nobody knows. Uh, Borges wrote a story called um, uh, the Hakim, the, the Dyer of Merv, which is about this figure, and his theory is that he has a, a, a leprous face, and that's why he doesn't show his mask, it doesn't show his face, wears a mask. And there's a lot of other connections, and the more I opened up sort of just what would Chambers have been looking at at the time, what might he have been reading, the more places that the King in Yellow sort of yields in from. And for example, uh, a lot of people think, oh, Chambers came up with the suicide booths in Repair of Reputations, and that's crazy and original, except that Maupassant came up with it in a story called um, uh, um, uh, the, the Somnolent, mm -hmm. which is about a guy who falls asleep while reading about suicides and dreams that he's in the future. Uh, and when he's in the future, he's welcomed to the suicide booth by the guy, and you're just, you smell the, the flowers that you most love and are put to sleep by a gas. And then he wakes up, and he wakes up from his dream, but he doesn't know if he's dead and just dreaming that he's awake because it's Maupassant, and Maupassant was dying of syphilis. Um, but there's a suicide booth. And then I said, well, at least I've nailed, I've nailed down that suicide booth. He 
he got it from Mopassan. Oh no, Ignatius Donnelly wrote it, uh, put his suicide boots all over future New York in a, in a novel that he wrote in 1889. At, at some point it's like, all right, show of hands, who does not have a mysterious yellow king in a suicide booth, people? <laughs> Dickens, I'm looking at you. you know, and, and so the, the, the degree to which Chambers must have just been this omnivorous reader, and the degree to which, as you say, the decadents are informed right. by all these cultural currents, uh, just shows up time and time again. And so much of this is because, as I mentioned, no one has done, in the world since Google, no one has written about Chambers. Right. So this is the easiest thing to do. This is not Ken is a brilliant researcher. This is Ken has the first boat going west. Hey, it's America. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, you know, the, the, the black stars turn out to be from a, a scene in a novel by Heinrich Heine called uh, Florentine Nights, which is about Paganini, the uh, satanically inspired uh, violinist, playing so evilly that the sky turns white and the stars turn black and shine right. down. And you think, well, Heinrich Heine, that's kind of a reach, except that 1893 was Heine's centennial, right. and Charles uh, Godfrey Leland translated all of Heine in 1891 and released it, and there was a giant controversy in the New York City papers about where they were going to put the statue of Heinrich Heine, mm -hmm. and so Chambers is sitting there writing the stories and then looking at the newspaper, and it's like, ah, Heine, and, and maybe he read it in Paris, maybe he read it whenever, but he would have pulled down Heine, opened it up and said, black stars in a white sky, that's awesome. I'm putting that in my book. Yeah. <laughs> and the degree to which Chambers, I mean, he's still a genius. He's still creating this alchemy and right. uh, these allusions that we're, we're following along and taking these weird little bits out of Ambrose Bierce, uh, again, in his weird jackdaw way, and creating this bizarre set of mythology is maybe a strong word, but these interconnected legends, and making these stories that we're still reading today, but it's not so much it springs right out of his head and his seafood allergies like it does with Lovecraft. Right. So much of this stuff is coming out of this cultural uh, 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 bouillabaisse that is the 1890s well, and, and that the he was way, part of. If you look at his overall output, too, it's um, he's very much a popular author. He's writing romances. He's writing, oh, secret service stories? I can do those. Mm -hmm. um, I can do weird, strange animal stories. I can do anything. And so he's got this massive output. He wrote kids' books. Um, and so that's exactly the sort of output you would expect from somebody who is pulling in all of this stuff from pop culture and the uh, um, high culture around him because he's moving between the two worlds. Yeah. He was, uh, people very rapidly began to make fun of Robert W. Chambers uh, when he became a bestseller. And there's a, a, a snotty uh, article in a Boston literary magazine that I, I loved that sort of ranked him as the um, uh, the uh, lower middle brow. Right. <laughs> he's not quite the upper lower brow, <laughs> but he's with chewing gum and watching baseball. He's a yeah. lower middle brow. Right. Uh, he's not up with opera or, or great things. Right. So the, the, even, in, even in 1900, 1910, people yeah. are giving him shade. He, he knows about opera, <laughs> right, but, yeah. but he's not up there. He's not opera. up there. He's not opera. Uh, so so the, the, the degree to which he is part of that culture and then goes and sells it back to them and, and makes a fat lot of money and collects porcelain. Good for you, Robert W. Chambers. <laughs> no, no expired Excellent. beans and dying of kidney yeah. disease yeah, right. pal. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I'm, I'd be curious to hear from the, the panelists um, what, like out of, out, of, out of the stories that we're familiar with here, um, or the ones we're not familiar with, what do you find kind of most compelling and, uh, and why do you think is so compelling, you know. Some of it, I think, is going to be a little bit off this, but, but maybe not, you know. But, uh, but what do you think? Start over there. Oh, okay. Go for it, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't see it. Um, as I said, I, I think the the room b between, especially the first four stories in King and Yellow, that leave room for other artists to do things with the material is is incredibly compelling. I think and this is something he, he picked up from the decadence, this idea that art is a gateway and a possible replacement for reality mm -hmm. is uh, marvelous. And that's, you get the fragments of, of the play and the way that interacts with the, the potentially horrible things uh, that 
that weight behind it. And that's something the Chambers did that was popularizing <clears throat> something that the, the decadents were doing, where they were talking about anything art can do, uh, anything nature can do, right. art can do better. Right. You can always make something from your imagination that is more wonderful than nature. Mm -hmm. um, except Chambers comes in and kind of throws the curve at the end that art is this gateway into this possible marvelous world that is horrible, horrible, horrible. Uh, <laughs> you actually don't want to go there. Uh, and so he's sort of this transitional figure, and this isn't a surprise uh, for somebody who is writing as much uh, pop stuff as he was, uh, to people like Guy Boothby or Sax Romer, who would take figures like the King in Yellow and make them Fu Manchu or Dr. Nicola or Dr. Mabuse in Germany, uh, where the popular authors have this towering, unknown, mysterious figure who represents decadence and crime. That's, that's a little later than, than what's going on here. Uh, Chambers is sort of a half step there from the decadence, that possibly art can introduce you to something that is incredibly malevolent. So, so one thing that, that makes me curious about is the, 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 the sort of the, the art versus nature issue. Chambers famously was an outdoorsman. Mm -hmm. He obviously loved being out in nature. I wonder, do you have any idea, or can do you have any idea, does anybody? Um, was that kind of a deliberate reaction in some way, do you think? It's definitely part of the, the decadent aesthetics that he was, he was part of, in, especially when he was painting in France, um, you know, when he was involved in that. Yeah. There's a, a, I mean, I think the work that you're referring to is, uh, uh, it's translated either as against nature or against the grain. Yep, the uh, yeah, the yeah. yeah, and by J.K. Huisman. Uh, or Huiman, if you want to pronounce it yeah, that way, and uh, it's it's wonderful. It's wonderfully uh, you know bleak and misanthropic and uh, and, and uh, leaning into insanity, uh, and which are some of the things that I I mean the, the leaning into insanity is something that I find very attractive about uh, Chambers' uh, work. The I you know it, it kind of captures the texture of insanity both at a micro and macro level. Uh, in, in which, in a way, that's just delicious uh, and fun to play with, and, and deconstruct and do different things with. And it doesn't it, it doesn't really treat it cheaply. No, mm -hmm. you know, um, I mean, a repair of reputations obviously is the protagonist, but uh, but even but in all the stories that, that he kind of addresses that, it feels like it's something that's serious, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, he gives it the gravity it deserves. Yeah, I yeah. Know. Which, I mean, Poe did the same thing too, so sure. it's like it's in that tradition as well. Yeah. Sylvie. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello again. Tell us what's cool about Chambers. <laughs> well, um, you know, should I use this one or just like that? I think just like that. Um, so in, in the late 1800s, uh, there's a lot of, um, mid to late 1800s, there's a lot of kind of occ occultism stuff going on, you know, secret societies and people are believing in seances, they're trying to talk to ghosts and all that kind of stuff and, you know, there's going to be Golden Dawn eventually and all that kind of stuff. So there's all this stuff that's going on where, um, yeah, people are getting into really weird things and they're having really odd parties, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is part of the decadent kind, yeah. kind, kind yeah. of movement and, and they're, you know, asking themselves about the, li the limits of consciousness and of reality and later on that's going to lead to different forms of art and, and all that kind of stuff but in that time period yeah everybody's kind of like preoccupied with like with that kind of stuff and they're like oh let's get together and see if fairies are real which is like <laughs> Arthur Conan Doyle right, right? Yeah, you know yeah. like fairies might be real there might be fairies <laughs> uh, ghosts might be real um astral projection might be a thing and I think um when you look at some of these stories um they kind of tap into that there's a sense of Occultism, that if you read certain manuscripts, certain kinds of knowledge, you will unlock uh, like other kinds of information. So if you have access to this play, for example, you know, it will drive you crazy, but it will also might, you know, allow you to access a different kind of plane of To understand the world. Yeah, to understand the world different ways. And that's what some of these people are asking themselves. You know, they're getting together to do, yes, weird senses and put on funny costumes and, you know, babble things, but they're also, I mean, they're, they're having a good time and a beer, but they're also ultimately <laughs> trying to like understand something about the world in, in a different kind of way. And so I think it reflects, yeah, this kind of moment in time when everybody's kind of tuned into that and, tr and trying to, f to find a certain frequency. And some of these stories seem to reflect that, um, 
the kind of desire, but also the, like, the imminent decadence of that pursuit. Like it's not gonna go well for you if right. you do that. And and yeah, and so and there's some other writers that um, that are writing in that vein. And I forgot this guy who uh, Count whatever. So, oh, he got reprinted last year. This guy was nuts, all right? He yeah. was like... Billiard's dialed at him? He was this, no, this noble guy, and he wrote these decadent romantic poems. He also lo- wrote, like, short stories. He dressed funny, like, in a top hat, and he carried a turtle mm-hmm. under his arm. That kind of stuff. Right. Um, Stenbach? Yes, Stenbach. Right. That's, guy, that, that's the dude. And he just got reprinted, right, last year. Uh, they did a new volume of his, of yeah. his translations. Yeah, yeah. So that, was, that guy is whack. That kind of guy... There's a lot of guys like that going yeah. around, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like trying to like writing their poetry and you know and doing and dressing funny and you know and that kind of stuff. So I think it reflects like really a type of personality and, and ethos of of the time. So well, and, and it's partly the the um, as you get closer to the turn of the century, the technology is changing the society mm-hmm. radically and people are trying to find where their place is in the world, and so they're looking for those. And they're doing a lot of drugs. Like, we don't, think, we don't think about, like, the 1800s, anybody and did drugs, but they're, like, drinking absinthe and, and, yeah, and yeah. like, you know, morphine, and, and it's, and like... hash and everything yeah, seven else. 7-Up has um, lithium? Yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. So um, they're like, ooh, yeah, you know, like, more morphine, and, you know, it's like... And, of course, you see things when you're on morphine, like, you're, like... Um, if you do it right. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't just go to sleep, people. That's that's the regular. Thing. <laughs> Get the good morphine. Yeah. And, and so, especially in in Europe, like I mentioned, the the criminal fiction stuff uh, in France, especially, that becomes uh, Fantomas, who is this figure like the King in Yellow, who can be anyone and can take the mask off at any time, or somebody you think is someone you know at any time could actually be Fantomas. And that was, again, flipping between this high art, low art. Uh, they're doing these uh, French pulps with uh, the detective, the male detective, and the male Fantomas dressed like nuns, shooting at each other over an open coffin. Uh, you know, that's the cover of these books, and they're just really odd. And uh, the uh, Dadaists later uh, picked up on all of this and absolutely loved them. Uh, I mean, Greek and, and Jerry uh, arrives in Paris basically right as Chambers is leaving. Right. Mm-hmm. They may have met. They may not have met. Yep. There's no way to know because and, and so, Jerry's life is, if anything, a bigger trash fire than Chambers is. Yep. And, um, and so you see this kind of through line with that, with these towering figures that that overwhelm everything and maybe the heart of this society or the culture that you're uh, that you're part of. And it may be just an empty mystery if you look at the Fantomas stuff. Uh, the detective who thinks he understands Fantom, who Fantomas is, his superiors think he's he's not. Mm. Oh, it's you know, he thinks it's Fantomas again. You know, who put that guy in the bear cage and blew up the the ocean liner? Um, <laughs> those books are bananas. And, um, and and that's the sort of weirdness that all of this is tapping into as well. And if you go back. I think there is a line from Chambers to that material as well. And, and I think one of the core things to keep in mind is Chambers is just a good old country boy American who believes in true love and yep. going out and fishing and hunting. I mean, in his in an interview he did uh, with a paper uh, in America, he said, oh yeah, I hung a couple of things in the salon, but I went fishing instead of go to the opening. I mean, this is Chambers' <laughs> self-image. And in even in The King in Yellow, uh, there's a line where uh, Castain, Hildred Castain says, oh, I don't want to fish anymore. And it's like Chambers is hanging a big neon sign saying, he's mad and evil. <laughs> a man who will not fish is a bad man. <laughs> and, and so Chambers comes to Paris literally right as, dec- as the decadent movement is coming up. Um, uh, uh, Arabur is written like the year, two years before Chambers arrives in Paris. Yes. The, the so dec- all of the scandal is absolutely fresh, right? And the and the um, uh, the Rosicrucians that you're talking about are having their psychic warfare with each other, and and by means of competitive art shows is one of the ways they would do their <laughs> psychic warfare. Um, uh, the, uh, the there's a, a journal called La Decadence that happens right as Chambers is at the Beaux Arts. Um, 
uh, Oscar Wilde is putting on Salome in France because he's, it's illegal to show his play in London. Uh, uh, uh. And also dressing Sarah Bernhardt in yellow yep. and hanging uh, all of the, the stage in yellow um, because uh, Wilde is playing with images of anti-Semitism and Chambers was an anti-Semite. And it's like, oh, that's good. That's going in the book. <laughs> um, and, and so all of this decadence is happening. And it, again, in those later interviews, he would talk about his friend Paul Verlaine and how great a guy Ernest Dowson was whenever you could get him away from absinthe and go fishing with him. And so the notion that he's at the Café Vachette across a table from de Maupassant watching his brains dribble out of his ears hmm. from tertiary syphilis, reading Maupassant's fiction just get more and more loopy as he writes it more with less and less of his brain operating. He's seeing the decadence happen. Hmm. It's not that he and, and maybe I imagine that as a as a young man in Paris he is tempted by aspects of the decadence. But as a good boy, he knows he's not supposed to be tempted by the that's aspects right. of that, the decadence. That's he, yeah, that's, that's and his little brother is there studying architecture, so he really can't go out cavorting with courtesans because someone's going to tattle the dad. <laughs> and so, but he sees this, and he is writing it not just with the fascination that we respond to it with from a safe hundred years but with legitimate terror. Well, and yeah, what so if that's... I go crazy? What if I get syphilis? What if I turn out to be like my buddy Paul Verlaine and my life is destroyed just because I drank absinthe with Rambo, right? That's, that would be a bad thing to happen to and, me. And all I'm the son people... of a lawyer, for God's sake. <laughs> and all of these people are focused on art, and where is art's role in this either as a gateway to that decadence or right. a reflection of that decadence? And, 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 and how does it, and his artistic sensibilities, and you could read his art criticism that he would write occasionally for like Common Wheel magazine when he came back. Uh, I think the polite way to say that is that they are a little bit old fashioned. Mm. Um, he describes Degas, for example, as the farthest you can go without madness. <laughs> Degas. <laughs> Ballet dancers. He's like, no. <laughs> That's the end. You are supposed to draw hunting dogs <laughs> or Greek gods. That is what art is for. Get it right, Dega. Mm. Yeah. The, um, there's a quote, um, and it's 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 from Jean Paul Sartre, so it's not the right time period. But he said, "It's my favorite quote from him." After I took mescaline, I started seeing crabs around me all the time. I mean, they followed me into the street, into class, and I just always picture like that fear, you know, like I took mescaline and the crabs followed me. So I, I always think that this is Chambers' fear. If I take mescaline or you know, like absent or in the time period, really crabs, right, right. crabs will follow me around to Paris, or, or a slug-like uh, grave attendant will follow yeah. me right there. Yeah. I'm an organist, my follow me through Paris. It's very dangerous. Yeah. You can get followed through Paris, people. <laughs> it's not like Brooklyn. It's not a safe town. <laughs> so, uh, I'm really curious now, do we still have uh, do we still have people conducting psychic warfare through competing art shows? Because if we don't, we, 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 I don't we can't know. talk about that. Yeah. 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 We should. Are you, yeah. tra are you trying to get Jim killed? Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of syphilis, <laughs> wow! Uh, I, I was uh, uh, that was a coincidence. Uh, uh, the, the, I was I was interested in the annotations to see a couple of mentions you kind of delved into. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the sort of the possible impact that that, that may have had. Can yeah. you talk about that a little bit? I mean, the thing is that syphilis is very much an endemic disease in the artistic set and in the sort of uh, uh, bohemian crowd that uh, Chambers ran around with. And that is because if you didn't want to have sex with a nice girl or boy, you had to have sex with a prostitute. And there, like, there was no cure for syphilis. So the, uh, the, the pool was basically uh, swim at your own risk, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so the, the condition goes on. There's lots of speculation. I think much of it unfounded that uh, Bram Stoker contracted syphilis from hanging around actresses. There's a great deal of speculation that various other figures may or may not have been syphilitic. We know for a fact that Maupassant was syphilitic. And again, literally being the first person to just go through Maupassant and saying, that's in chambers, that's in chambers, that's in chambers. This is not hard literary criticism, but I, I'm the first person to do it. Um, 
But Maupassant is very much on Chambers' mind. He wrote 330 short stories, basically, that are published in French periodicals and newspapers at the same time that Cham his career almost exactly brackets Chambers' time in Paris. And he dies in 1893, which is the year Chambers leaves Paris. So he's seen this happen, and it's part of his set, and because uh, good uh, 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 bourgeois boys didn't write home and say, ah, a funny story, I have syphilis. Um, <laughs> we don't know how many of the other American artists that were his friends uh, contracted the disease. I mean, we do know that his one son had uh, some sort of developmental disability, but it's not saying Chambers was syphilitic, and he certainly showed no signs of it later on in his life, but he would have been aware of that at all times and uh, focused on it in the same way that Edgar Allan Poe is very aware of tuberculosis mm -hmm. with his, you know, uh, his, his child bride and his, and his uh, uh, adored mother-in-law both dying of it. The Red Death does not become tuberculosis because we know that Edgar Allan Poe was obsessed with women coughing their bright red blood out onto the tablecloth, but it doesn't not become tuberculosis. Syphilis uh, separates lovers, it drives you mad, it is available in artistic circles. Um, uh, <laughs> it's it's Ask your doctor it's today. Yes. Right? And, if you, and, and it binds people together in a sort of a covert brotherhood, if you will. Um, it is very similar to how he presents the yellow sign uh, on, off, you know, over and over and over again. It has the same effects. And that might have been him saying why it is, it is as though decadence spreads like syphilis, and he thought, that's a good metaphor. Or it might have been a very good friend of his. We don't know how close he was or wasn't with Maupassant. We know they almost certainly had lunch together at some point because he name drops Maupassant's favorite cafe in his uh, one of his stories about Paris, the Our Lady the, of the Fields. And so he, uh, he may have been sitting there watching him. Uh, he, we know that he, he knew Verlaine, we know that he knew Dowson, both of those guys have that connection uh, in, in their life, um, so at the very least, it's a it's a present fear to him, and he's thinking about it in that same way. Yellow, of course, also is in addition to the uh, anti-Semitic badge that was uh, forced on Jews during the Middle Ages, and was still associated with, with Jews uh, uh, in anti-Semitic art. It was also the quarantine flag, and you flew a yellow flag on your ship if you had disease. Yellow is also representative of fever because it's the yellow fever. It's the color of diarrhea. It's the color of unset bone. It's the color of all manner of things. It's the color of a disease called jaundice, which mm -hmm. is a kidney disease that turns your skin yellow. And what is the name of the mademoiselle in Mademoiselle Dice? Jean Dice. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's on his mind. <laughs> And that kind of, I think that kind of ties in to uh, another thing that you discussed, and that I think a lot of the panels could talk about some, which is the, in the stories, this kind of almost overt connection between love and death, you know, that, that kind of thematic, uh, I don't know, twinning of them, twining of them, you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know what you mean. Tell them what we mean. Yeah. I, I don't think they it's need to. It's dangerous. This shit is dangerous. Yeah. Dangerous, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, I... I, I, I'm just going to say this really quick because I, I'm sure that Nicole and Sylvia and Jim have better things to say. Definitely Sylvia and Nicole yeah. have better things to say. <laughs> um, but the, the notion that Freud stumbles over 20 years after the fact that uh, he says the two causes of irrationality are eros and thanatos. Uh, madness of love and madness of death. The death wish and the love wish. And this says more about Freud than it does about life. But... <laughs> Chambers is responding to the same exact currents of Middle European weirdness that Freud is responding to. And he puts Thanatos literally on the cover of the fourth edition of the book. The, the king in yellow figure is drawn holding Thanatos' upside down torch mm. from Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. Thanatos' symbol is the butterfly. Butterflies appear in Our Lady, of the F uh, Our Lady of the Fields, and there's a butterfly on the back of, I think, the third edition of the king in yellow, again, drawn by Chambers. Chambers also a uh, big butterfly collector, it turns out. Um, so, and Eros, obviously, it appears twice in the stories and once in a uh, epigraph. Um, so Eros and Thanatos are these sort of covert presences in the stories, and then the stories are quite obviously about love and death. In the case of uh, Mademoiselle Dice or Demoiselle Dice, uh, it is literally a story of love and death being 
overlaid and being the same. And where is that in the in the in the collection? It's right in the middle. It's the pivot that the stories turn around. That you can say the first four are stories of death, and the Paris stories are stories of love. Right. And that there we are. But it's it's present in all of them, with the exception of Court of the Dragon, that has no overt love element. But but it, th that's what I would say. And then hopefully. Sylvia and Nicole would say better things. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think you covered it pretty well. Um, it, yeah. So I'm, I'm more. I mean, what, what I'm more interested in is, uh, you know, the, it's the earlier stories in the cycle that are most interesting to me, just because. Uh, and, and when I when I wrote my story for the Chaosium anthology, I definitely did have the madness in the context of a romantic relationship, and I think what that can do is key into one of the elements of the King and Leo mythos that is so attractive, which is loss of control. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the, you, know, you know, when you see, you know, the yellow sign takes away your volition. You have no will of your own. Uh, and which is something that both love and death have in common. Uh, what I'm, I'm intrigued by is how it, it tackles it in a kind of fragmentary way. Uh, and, you know, these stories kind of uh, you know, there's, there's, fra you know, when I say fragmentary, there's gaps in between them that we exploit as 21st century writers kind of exploring the mythos. But I'm often, you know, I'm just curious about like what led to the fragments and why, you know, how did it evolve in the way that it evolved and wish we could get some insight into that with, with uh, Chambers, uh, you know, biography when maybe there's room for, in scholarship for that about how it developed that way. Well, there's a lot of room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, so I think, I think, what you've said is is pretty accurate, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I think like obviously if I wrote a pornographic story, I thought yeah. that maybe <laughs> you know, at like, the early sex and death, like yeah. sex and death are connected. Maybe, um, yeah, yeah, because of that, and yeah, because of the time period, like you said, if you read any like biographies of, peri of people living in that time period, there's some very interesting libertines that the first time you hear about this famous artist or whatever, you're like, he's sexy, and then you're like. He had horrifying syphilis and sores to work, and you're like, I don't want to know anything yeah, about right, this right, man. Right. You know, it's just disgusting, and um, and yeah, no, it gets really quite gross. But there's also yeah, like there's this image of like the libertine, the like you know, uh, decadent, you know, sexy guy, and then you're like, but he's covered in pus, and, and right. you, know, you can't after you read a couple of those, you cannot unsee it. You know, right. like, you will never look at one of those guys again. You're like, no. <laughs> yeah. And and so it becomes embedded in you, you know. And and there's this whole tradition of um um for example, women that drive like guys to their doom, uh, with mm. John Keats, the you know, the beautiful woman sans merci, you know, like and and it and it goes on and on. Um so there's always this connection I think in literature and especially in the decadent times between yeah, sex and you know, and, and destruction, you know, like it's very interesting, but you might be destroyed, so don't go there. But then it's very interesting, so you're like kind of like that. And like in the same way that I think some protagonists look for um, forbidden knowledge that is intellectual, yeah. you know, like Lovecraft's protagonists look for forbidden intellectual knowledge. Yep. There's other protagonists that are moved by experiences and, you know, and, and very much erotic experiences, fleshy experiences. And, you know, and, and I think that. You know, it's not explicit in chambers, but you kind of think like, you know, like maybe some of the people who are interested in this stuff in these stories like are into it because of that kind of knowledge. And then, you know, Cliff Barker kind of makes it explicit yeah. and it goes to Hellraiser and it's like, yes, we all want to open Why have you said the quiet part loud? <laughs> yeah, you know, like. Yeah, but like that's also about opening like a certain kind of like forbidden knowledge, forbidden lore. But now it's like a, it's a Rubik's Cube. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a decadent room. A decadent room. You know. All yellow. Yes. Um, yeah. it, well, and that's uh, if you look at um, uh, the society at the time, what the decadents were doing by saying this stuff out loud, by having uh, productions that were overtly sexual and things mm -hmm. like that. That's where uh, the the reading audience for this would be looking at that as that is in di a different window on the world. Mm -hmm. So love is going to, or sex is going to give me this different window on experience. Um, and it's got the threat associated with it. And I think that the idea of looking at the, the entirety of King and Yellow as that, pip, you know, that uh, uh, binary with the pivot in the middle is very interesting because that gives the book as a whole more of an identity than four really good stories, and then, huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. 
can, uh, can you talk a little more about the the, the sort of the, uh, the the way that we have those four scary stories, the spooky stories that everybody loves, and the romances, you know, and is there more between them than just that pivot, that, that contrast of the things that kind of tie them together? I think one of the things that ties them together is that uh, the, I mean, some of it is very obvious, that uh, they're, all, they're almost all urban stories, with the exception of Demoiselle Dees. They take place either in Paris or New York. Uh, they are all about art. Art appears in both of them, both sets. Mm -hmm. uh, both have artistic protagonists yep. because, again, uh, guess what? Chambers was an art student when he wrote most of them, yep. or a practicing artist in Greenwich Village when he wrote the last few of them. Um, so his, uh, his the art runs through all of them. They are connected by uh, various thematic uh, sort of tropes, like mirrors show up all throughout because it's famously art's job is to hold a mirror up to life. And then Chambers is like, look in the mirror, see what you see. Oh, it's a crazy person. That's you. Uh. <laughs> and sort of that mise on a beam structure of a fiction about a fiction about a fiction yep. that is so very beautiful and crazily layered in repairer is present not as magnificently in a lot of the other stories, even in stories like Rue Barre, where the characters are mirroring each other because one of them truly loves the young Grisette, uh, who we are uh, maybe thought to believe is a prostitute, but maybe not. Um, but he won't say anything because he listens to dad back home in Brooklyn or in Millbrook, Connecticut. And um, uh, the other character, who's the sort of jaded Rue and artist, has declared his love for the Grisette, and she's blown him off because she doesn't love him. And so he loved but was saved by her lack of love. The other guy, uh, loved but was saved by order and respectability. Mm -hmm. And so there's a weird sort of a twinning going on in that story, which is again a relatively, I don't even think it's the best of the Paris stories, but if, when you look at it as, you know, who's in the mirror? Who's holding up the twin? Where is the death impulse? The impulse to marry a Grisette, as is almost literally said by another character, is a suicidal impulse mm -hmm. socially. It's like, yeah, right back home to mom, the stock, mom and dad, dad the stockbroker, and say, Guess what? I've married a French washerwoman. This is going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> and you will literally die uh, poor and alone in Paris. Right. Mm. So what about the stories? Any of the stories in, the, in this collection especially, do you think that uh, people tend to overlook, don't have the context to appreciate? You know, Has anything kind of captured your imagination that, uh, that uh, that you, that, uh, that you think others might be surprised on? No. <laughs> yeah, no. No surprises. No, I, yeah, I mean, I think, I think. It's just your standard time-shifting, weird, unreliable narrator story. Yeah, yeah and that was, yeah, again, that was, the, that was the part of Repairer that really struck me was that kind of hallucinogenic quality to that story that seems very much ahead of its time. Right. Um, and uh, you know the the um, the only other experience like that I've had is is I was driving for 16 hours and and pulled into a hotel and watched uh, turned on Cemetery Man halfway through um, and and finished watching the movie and then thought I must not have seen that film all the way through um, and then watched it again and yeah I guess I did um, and and. Going back and looking at Repairer and the way it's it's structured and the way that the story is told is uh, is remarkable. That that's a story that that bears many repeated readings. Mm. There's something very modern, Twin Peaks and Lin Chi and whatever about some of these stories, uh, in comparison to some of the other stuff that's that's going on. That's that's just very cool. I think we respond to it because it actually fits very well with our aesthetic now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so good for him. <laughs> All right, uh, we are over. I yes. completely lost track of time, and uh, our good friends are uh, are waiting and waiting and waiting. So yes, we shall run Nicole, away. Sylvia, Jim, thank you so much for coming. Yeah.